Okay, I'm here with James Marks today. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, you did. All right, for the Remembering Benzie Oral History Project. And I'm going to be interviewing him about his service in the military. Okay, I'm going to start out with a few like basic questions just to get you comfortable talking about yourself. Mm -hmm. So, um, where were you born? In Appleton, Wisconsin, near Green Bay. Okay. And um, who are or were your parents, and what were their occupations? My parents were Isidore and Lorraine Marks, and uh, they farmed in okay. Calumet County. Yeah, okay, so what did they farm like? How was Dairy farm. Okay. Dairy farmers. I milked a lot of cows when I was younger. <laughs> okay. Um, did you have any siblings? I have an older brother, Tony, and uh, a younger brother, Chuck, and three younger sisters. Okay. There's did, six of us. <laughs> big family. Uh, did any of them serve in the military? My older brother, Tony, did. Okay. What branch was he in? U.S. Army also. Okay. All right. Uh, did you attend college? Yes. Right. Where? Stout State University in Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, what did you study there? Industrial engineering. Can you tell me more about what that is? <laughs> um, you probably know engineering is designing the products. Mm -hmm. Industrial engineering is designing the processes to manufacture the products. Okay. Uh, and do you have any hobbies? Um, right now, I actually have two younger children. I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, so they take up most of my spare time. And then I also I like photography and uh, I hiking. I forgot, I totally forgot, but you can take off your mask. Oh. All right, there you go. <laughs> um, I have two young children, Sadie and Arlo, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. They take up most of my spare time, but I like photography and uh, hiking. Um, and did you hold any jobs before you entered the service? No, I was a student. All right, okay. So now we're going to get on to your early days of service. So uh, on your biographical data sheet, you mentioned you were drafted into the Army. Can you recall when, how you found out? Uh, it was in June, and it came as a surprise to me because they had a lottery system at that time that just started up in 1970. There was a lot of demonstrations and protesting against the whole draft process and procedure because it seemed like just uh, the... Uh, poorer people were being drafted and the more money people had, they could got their kids out of the draft and stuff. So they just came up with a lottery system. Everybody was in it and it was all equal and fair. And my number was 181. And it, it went by birth date, February 8th. Everybody born with their number was 181. And I thought that was going to keep me out of the service because they said that they'll likely go through up to 120 and maybe up to 180, but not likely over that. So well, I thought I'm pretty safe. But I didn't, that was on a national average. I didn't re realize each county was going to have their own quota. And for Calumet County, it was an older agrarian community, and there were only old people, uh, very few young people. The young ones had gone off uh, to other, to the bigger cities. And so they went through all the numbers in Calumet County that year. So oh. by June already, I, they were up to 181, and I got a notice to report for uh, the physical. You had to take a physical to see if you were fit to serve. All right, and then um, what was your reaction when you found out? Like, what were you thinking? Surprise, mostly. <laughs> and, and then kind of it uh, eventually turned into a, uh, what do I want to say, um, a realization that, okay, you're going in, and but I had three years of college, and I thought, well, I'll have an office job somewhere, and I had computer programming experience, and I'll be programming a computer somewhere, probably in the States. That was my expectation. Okay. And then, uh, do you remember uh, your family members and friends' reactions? Um, I know my mother was not pleased with it uh, because she, my br older brother Tony had already served in Vietnam and um, that was tough for a parent who has a child there and not knowing are they coming back, not coming back. They know they're in a dangerous 
place. And uh, she, I'm sure she didn't want to go through that experience again. Yeah. Uh, so when you left, uh, who did you leave behind? Like family, pets? I had a girlfriend at the time. So of course, my mother, father, brothers and sisters. Uh, the pets, I guess, were all the cows on the farm. <laughs> and uh, I had a girlfriend at the time that I had been going with for about six months or a year. Okay. And um, what type of training did you have? In the military? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, the first thing, everybody starts out the same and you all go through basic training. And that training is meant primarily getting you in shape and... Uh, learning discipline, things like that, and uh, uh, basics with the rifle and things. And I have to admit, I didn't take that very seriously because, again, I was expecting I'm going to have a desk job somewhere. My brother did with no college education. Yeah. And he had a desk job. He was in Vietnam, but doing uh, clerical work. So that was sort of my expectation, and I wasn't really paying attention. I... I uh, wasn't taking it very seriously through basic training. Okay. Um, so where did you complete basic training? I had my basic training at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, uh, home of the 101st Airborne Division. Okay. Uh, can you tell me what the 101st Airborne is exactly? Um, it has a, a very uh, storied history in world, particularly in World War II in Europe. And uh, they created the, well, I know a lot of the history because not only in it, but at Fort Campbell, uh, you have the museums and such. It started in the Civil War. And you've heard of um, the Eagle, uh, Old Abe Eagle. Mm -hmm. That was out of Wisconsin and part of the, it was a regiment out of, the, out of Wisconsin that had that mascot, Old Abe, as the Eagle. And in World War II, they re brought it up again. It, I guess they disbanded it when the wars were over. And then needed, uh, when the army was growing for World War II, they organized it again as the 101st Airborne. And you have, there's mechanized units in the army, and these are the people in the tanks and are moving that way. And then you have foot soldiers, and then airborne, they're the soldiers who are in the airplanes and parachute out and jump into the battlefields. Uh, what role were you? Did you have with the 101st Airborne? Um, I was uh, I was trained in, in after basic training. You go to AIT, Advanced Infantry Training, and uh, that's when I realized that I was in. They was assigned to the infantry, so I knew I was going to have, have a desk job. Uh, so I started paying attention. I took AIT very seriously in Fort Polk, Louisiana. The other thing I knew about Fort Polk, Louisiana, it was sort of the jumping off ground to Vietnam. If you went to Fort Polk, you're 99% likely going to be in uh, Vietnam. Anyway, so I took that series. And I was trained in mortars. Uh, the infantry is broken down into two units, the uh, 11 Bravo, which is riflemen, and 11 Charlie, which I was, which are mortars. And it's... Um, Call it a piece of artillery, but uh, it's a small piece that soldiers use. And that's what I was trained in. And um, when I arrived in Vietnam, uh, they assigned me to the 101st Airborne. Um, and then I went up. I, you fly into Da Nang, which was sort of a air base there, and everybody went to their different divisions. And... I went to the 101st and went to Camp Evans. That was their base camp in, in the north part of South Vietnam, along, near the DMZ. And uh, then they assigned me to uh, Delta Company. And I, I knew enough already that Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta are rifle companies. And those are the people that are out patrolling the areas and uh, the jungle. And then... Uh, Echo Company is where the mortars are on the fire bases, and that's where I, I and I explained, well, I'm Levin Charlie, and they said, well, uh, Delta Company got hit that day and needed replacements, and so I went on on a resupply and was a replacement, and they said, as soon as we can get you back, we'll bring you back, and 11 months later, they did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so you mentioned earlier that um, when you arrived at your advanced individual training, then you knew that you were going to Vietnam. So when you were first um, drafted, did you not know you were going to be in Vietnam? No, I su again, I suppose I knew there was a likelihood, it was a possibility, but uh, uh, I didn't think I was going to Vietnam uh, that, uh, again, because I had the education, three years education, I'd have a desk job, and that if I did, I would be just in a base camp somewhere doing clerical work or logistics or something like that. You know, only one out of ten soldiers is really in the infantry. It takes nine other so soldiers to support that one. So even if I went to Vietnam, I thought there was only a 10% chance of being in the infantry. Okay. Um, so uh, back to training. Uh, what did a typical day look like in training? Up early in the morning. Uh, I remember that, and uh, very structured. It isn't like you have free time. Everything is structured. Uh, everybody gets up at the same time. You have time to uh, to just get ready for the day, make your bed, things like that. And then PT, physical training, is a big part of it. And uh, then uh, whatever training they have for that day, uh, and it's all kinds of things in terms of uh, map reading and all the things that would go along that are necessary, uh, first aid, um, very structured, very long days, and then during the night uh, you always had guard duty, they called it uh, fire patrol, because you didn't need guard duty, nobody was going to attack you in the training camps there, but uh, it was, I think, to prepare you for being on guard duty when uh, you'd get to Vietnam because we did all take guard duty at night and uh, you have to force yourself to, even though you're tired, you worked hard all day, uh, you still have to stay up for that hour until someone else comes and relieves you. Oh, that's really interesting. That's, I didn't know that. But, uh, okay, so what is your most vivid memory of time and training? Goofing off. <laughs> I really was kind of a goof off. I admit that I was. Uh, I was in pretty good shape going in. The physical training wasn't difficult for me. I actually rather enjoyed that because I'd been in cross country and track and I liked running. <laughs> so <laughs> that didn't. Okay. Uh, and then what was the best part of training for you? Um. I don't know that it was the best, but it's just kind of getting it over with because everybody else there was taking it so seriously, you know, and I, that is the job of the drill sergeants, and they're on you all the time, and uh, I guess I knew what they were going through and why they were doing it and uh, the purpose they had, and I, I uh, respected that, uh, but still couldn't get quite involved as they would probably wanted me to be in it. All right, and then do you remember what the worst part was of training? It was hard for me getting up in the middle of the night and doing being the, doing the the fire watch, and uh, because you did the days were long and you worked hard, and uh, you're tired, and it was hard staying awake during that that full hour that you had to stay awake. Uh, do you do you remember any particular instructor that stands out in your mind? No, I, I really don't. I, they're all the same, you know. There's you've seen movies in the stereotypical drill sergeant. That's exactly they're all like that. <laughs> they're all a stereotypical drill sergeants. They're yelling and screaming at you, and all for all for a great purpose, and that's to prepare you. So, um, was your first assignment after basic training going to Vietnam? Well, then I went to advanced infantry training in Fort Polk, Louisiana, and learned uh, 
learned uh, the M16 and the uh, and the eight, 81 millimeter mortars, how to fire them, and. Uh, did you qualify with any other equipment? A uh, pistol also. I think qualified in pistols and rifles, and then uh, the mortar. And then um, on your uh, biographical data sheet, you mentioned your highest rank was as an E-5 sergeant. How did you receive this promotion? Doing what you're told. <laughs> Surviving. In a war zone, I think it's easy to make uh, rank. Uh, just do what you're told to do. And uh, I think I walked point for the first five months. And... Uh, even though I didn't have to. It was a voluntary position. And then uh, when I came back from my r and R, I had decided I wasn't going to walk point anymore. And I became the radio operator for the company. And then within a month, so within six months, I was promoted to E5 sergeant and uh, made a team leader. Uh, so why did you volunteer to walk point? Um, my first night in country, I, I told you I went out on a resupply mission after they were, they were hit, and uh, uh, that's a scary night for you. You know, here it is, your first night, you're out in the jungle in Vietnam, and you know the enemy knows where you are. You, they were around that day. And I could have been on guard duty all night, because I didn't sleep. I was wide awake. And what happens is uh, when you are under attack, you bring in artillery and airstrikes, and they're firing all around the jungle and hit, blowing up trees and stuff like that. So there are branches just barely hanging on, and then in the middle of the night they'll break off, and that's all you hear is that cre and And it's so dark in this jungle, you can't see your hand in front of your face. It's uh, There's not moonlight or starlight. It's just dense... Uh, a lot of places, dense uh, canopy jungle cover, you see nothing. And so you don't see anything, but you're hearing this. And so your mind, in your mind's eye, you start seeing all these NVA creeping up on you. And uh, then somebody will fire off a flare to light up the sky. And you see there's nothing out there. But uh, so just a scary night. But the next morning, the platoon leader, the lieutenant, has a map and he's showing me where we are and he shows me where we're going. And I thought that was pretty nice that he's pointing this all out to the new guy. And then he hands me the map and that's when it dawned on me, oh, I'm walking point. And <clears throat> point is a voluntary position and if nobody else volunteers then it's like seniority. Then the new guy, uh, the least senior person, was the one to do it. Um, it was probably only a few weeks after that when the next new guy came in. And I never, I, that never sat right with me. I thought, well, I don't know anything about this. Why are you making me do this? And uh, so uh, when the next new guy came in, I chose to continue walking point. Plus, I was, start, I was getting good at it. I knew how to read the maps. I knew the contours. And... I had a system that I thought was to our benefit, and I always, if we're here and we're going there, I looked for the most difficult route to get us there. It's always an easy route if you take a ridge line, or if you go down in the valley, because the valleys get washed out and there's not much jungle there. Those are the two easiest ways to get there. Follow a valley up or take a ridge line. And I always looked for where the steepest contours were, and that's where I went, the most difficult route. Because the NVA, they can't booby trap the whole jungle. They can't set up ambushes over the whole jungle. And they're sure not going to do it where I was going. <laughs> so that's what I did. The guys used to complain, and I always said, anybody want to step forward and take point, go ahead. And nobody would. So, And we had all day. And we never went far, a few miles a day. It's just from one hilltop to the next hilltop. And so time wasn't an issue. I was just have all day, you might as well go there the safest way. And that was my philosophy through it. Okay. Um, so, what were your responsibilities as E5 sergeant and team leader? Um, 
well, you have a company of men, and then the men is broke down into three platoons, and then each platoon has two teams. And uh, when they're at full strength, and we never seem to be at full strength, that would mean probably a dozen, a dozen guys, and um, it was all men at the time. And there'd be uh, uh, somebody that walk, that'd be walking point, and there'd be a machine gunner and his assistant that carried the ammo and always helped them with the machine gun and he just uh, were the leader for these 12 guys. Okay. And then you mentioned earlier that you were the radio operator. Can you tell me uh, more what you did with that and what your responsibilities were? Um, <clears throat> as a radio operator and I was the, for the, the CP is the command post the command center where the captain is for all the different platoons. And you're just stand next to him at all times because you're, that is the communication with the other platoon leaders and also with the base camp back and getting instructions, uh, calling in airstrikes if it's necessary, uh, coordinating with artillery on the, the fire bases or mortars on the bases. And also, every three or four days were resupplied, and so you had to call in what your needs are for resupplies. With ammo, you needed to resupply and food and anything special, batteries or anything special needs, and you had to communicate that. It, it in, when I was first a uh, radio operator, it was somewhat difficult because everything had to be coded. Uh, you couldn't just speak numbers over the phone because that would give away... if. Uh, the NVA happened to be listening in or could be listening in on that frequency, they'd hear all the information. So everything, you had a code card, you had to spin it around and get the code. And so you had to code everything and then any communication back, you had to decipher that, what it was. But I did that for about a month and then they came out with what they called a secure set. And the frequency was constantly changing frequencies at the same pattern that the base camp was changing frequencies at, so we could speak uh, numbers and things over right over the secure set so that came a little easier you didn't have to do the decoding the coding okay. uh, so what do you think was the hardest part of the military lifestyle for you to adapt to and why do you think that was The hardest part, many people would say discipline, but it wasn't for me. I I was expected to do what I was told at home. <laughs> Mother and father expected that. I went to a Catholic uh, grade school. The nuns expected that. So I was used to be doing what I was told. So that part was easy. Um, I think the living conditions were probably the most difficult in Vietnam because you're just living in the mud and the rain and um, you're always wet, uh, uh, hard to keep your feet dry and in good shape and in good condition. My, uh, when I was walking point, you're basically, you're not just walking through, the, you're cutting away through the jungle with a machete and your hands are always cut up. And uh, um, I think the monsoon season, the living conditions are just awful. Um, I remember one time sitting for two days on a sea ration box and not moving and just the poncho over because it was raining so hard. Um, leeches, mosquitoes, didn't like the end. So you, the way it worked, every three weeks we were out, we were out in the bush for three weeks. Then we'd come back for a week on a fire base in exchange with one of the Alpha, Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta companies. We went on this rotation. And so you'd think, oh, you get back on the fire base. And the fire base was a little better because uh, if it's raining, you've got a bunker you can go in. But there are rats. You'd wake up in the night and from rats crawling over you. That was spooky. <laughs> I bet. Uh, so did you ever adapt to the environment in Vietnam? No. I don't think anybody does. No. Yeah. I've since, I've hiked the Appalachian Trail uh, for six months. That was a piece of cake compared to the living conditions in Vietnam because um, uh, 
it's just the monsoon season's just awful. And you think of the jungles being hot and sweaty, and it is, but in the monsoon season when it's raining, you're cold. I sat there shivering for days in the cold. So. Okay. And uh, what do you think was the easiest part of the military lifestyle for you to adapt to? I think the discipline is doing what you're told. That was easy for me. I knew what uh, who my superiors were, and if they gave me an order, I just did it. Okay. Um, and then, when you first arrived in Vietnam, like, what were your thoughts, if you can remember? Well, I do remember, and uh, I'm on an airplane with a couple hundred other guys going there. And on the ride over, you, in my mind, I was an engineer, and I numbers and math and statistics were a big part of that and I went through the calculations I'm like what's the odds I'm coming back I'm going in the infantry and um, so you're sort of calculating that and you said well you got a 90 percent chance of coming back even in the infantry and um, you know you're prepared you've trained you've been trained for it and um, is when we landed in Da Nang uh, they told us as we were landing that uh, do quick time, which is basically running to the hangar, because uh, while the plane didn't want to spend much time down on the ground there and have uh, rockets or anything come in. And when he told us that, and I thought, wow, this is real. <laughs> this is, isn't training anymore. It's real stuff now. Yeah. So what kinds of friendships and camaraderie did you form while serving, and with who? My plan was none. I really had two thoughts in my mind when I was uh, going over there. One is I wasn't going to make any friends. I wasn't going there to make friends. I was going to do whatever it took to come back home. That was my objective. Um, and the other is I'd heard about all the drugs and things that went on. I wasn't going to do any drugs there. And so I didn't do any drugs, but I did make a friend. <laughs> uh, guy named Tom Johannes, and, and uh, he was a radio operator in our platoon when I first arrived. And um, I just kept in touch with him and attended his wedding after we were both back home. Back home. And then when I remarried, he was here for my wedding when I remarried uh, eight years ago. So we're still in communication, Facebook friends, and keep in touch. That's really cool. Uh, so... Um, how did you stay in touch with family and friends? Writing letters, and I was pretty good with that. Well, I, didn't, I mentioned my brother was, uh, Tony was in Vietnam, and I remember it had gone maybe a month or two and hadn't heard from him, and so Mom is really worried and contacts the Red Cross. And so the Red Cross uh, found Tony and said, write a letter home. Your family's worried about you. And uh, I remember her going through that, and so I was pretty good at writing. And uh, you have time. Uh, at uh, night when there's some free time, you can write a letter, and even, even out in the bush you can do that, spe especially when you're on a fire base. You had time to write, so I tried to write home often. Oh, and I had a girlfriend, and of course I had to write her. <laughs> uh, so what did you do for recreation, or when you were off duty? Never off duty. Well, I shouldn't say that quite. But when you're in the bush, you're never off duty. There is no recreation. Uh, on the fire bases, there's really no recreation. But they did have uh, in-country R&R, and I spent two days at a place called China Beach near Da Nang on the South China Sea. And uh, I drank beer for two days <laughs> and laid on the beach. <laughs> uh, do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? Oh, a lot of unusual things, but nothing humorous. I don't remember anything humorous. What's, it's interesting you asked that question, though, because I was just going through and had gone through many of my photo albums, uh, the pictures that were taken, and every time there was a picture of me, I seemed to be smiling. 
but I don't remember ever being happy over there. <laughs> so I uh, may have been just smiling for the camera, but it wasn't a happy time. It's, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so was there anything you did for good luck that you did for good luck? No, no. Did anybody else? Oh, I'm sure everybody had their little thing for good luck and stuff like that, but uh, uh, that wasn't part of my nature to do anything for luck. Okay. Um, so how long were you in Vietnam? Uh, 11 months and a few days uh, because I went there early in January and uh, by... It was after Thanksgiving because I had Thanksgiving dinner out in the bush. And then sometime early December, remember they said they would bring me back to the rear when uh, they had an opportunity. Well, that was when I got back. And as soon as I got back at, uh, at the base camp, I, I spent a few days there and they said, you can go home now. And so I, was, I got maybe three weeks early. Um, getting out of Vietnam, and made it home in time for Christmas. So I never spent a Christmas there. Oh, wow. So uh, what were your thoughts when you came home? I'm sure you were very excited and happy. But... Relieved. Glad it's over. And uh, there were many people, if, um, when you, they call it getting short, when you're getting short and it's time to go, you could offer to extend for three more months, because most people had, they'd been in training for six months, a year in Vietnam, so they'd have six more months to do in the service when they were uh, got back home. So what you could do is re-up for three more months, and then they would just let you out of the army when you got home. You didn't have to finish the last three months. And there was no way I was going to volunteer to do that. My whole objective was to come home as soon as possible. And... Uh, so I wouldn't extend there, and I was just happy not to have uh, spent the, the extra. People have calendars that they're all, the donut dollies, they come out with uh, USO things, and they give you these calendars, and you just mark off each day. And I remember mine, seeing mine, is I never did get it finished. I still have those last 15, 20 days left on it. So did you have to finish uh, the three months over in the United States? Or? Well, I had six more months to do. And then after Christmas, uh, it was before New Year's because uh, I spent New Year's on Fort Hood. I was assigned then to Fort Hood, Texas, which made no sense to me because that's a mechanized unit. That's uh, the second armored division, Hell on Wheels. And uh, what are they going to do with me? <laughs> And that, that was the same question they asked when I got there. What are you going to do with me? They had nothing to do with me. And um, they told me that if I just hang around for another three weeks, I would have 18 months in. And that's what it took to get full GI Bill benefits. And uh, so I just hung around the fort for three weeks and did nothing. And uh, then they let me go home. <laughs> Uh, did you meet any friends there, or at Fort Hood? Yeah. No, I didn't know anybody. It wasn't nothing. In con I had a group of people because I was an E5 already. I was assigned to a barracks, and then I was like the leader in that barracks. And so every morning, we would have to uh, get up and before breakfast police the area. That's where you walk along the area picking up any. It was mostly cigarette butts that you're picking up, and. Uh, I'd have to do that in the morning, lead that group, and then do the same thing in the evening. And that was it. I did a lot of reading and taking naps. <laughs> so, so uh, did you do anything else for recreation or anything? There, uh, they, had a, they had a rod and gun club on site, and so I'd spend time at the bar, drink some beer. Okay. Uh, how do you think your wartime experience changed you? I don't think it did. Um, and that may be unusual for people to say, but I think I went over there with an attitude that 
you do what you, have, what, you, what you do what you have to do there, and you're. I'm not Jim Marks anymore. I'm a soldier, and you just do what soldiers do. And when I come back, I'm going to be Jim Marks again. And that was pretty much my attitude toward it. There were little things like uh, when I first got back that it's just out of habit that you do things. Being walking point, you don't do anything. You never step on anything that looks like it shouldn't be there. And uh, you, I find myself walking even down the street looking <laughs> for stuff like that. Uh, or if there's an explosion, you want to hit the ground and you do that for a while, but that's just reflex. Uh, was it easier, easy or hard to adapt to coming home and being in a new environment? Um, it was easy for me because I just got right back into the life that I had. You know, a lot of people complain about not having the welcoming home ceremonies and all that, the soldiers from Vietnam, because in fact many of them were spat upon because of the stories they heard of soldiers out there killing babies and stuff like that, and that didn't happen. It, if it did, it was so rare. It, not in my, there were no villages in the area. I was up in the Ashaw Valley, and there was nothing there but jungles. There were no people. <laughs> so if you, it was a free fire zone. If you saw somebody, you shot them, because it, the NVA, the only people that were there. But um, I had my welcoming committee. I flew into uh, Minneapolis, near where I went to school. My fraternity brothers were all there welcoming me home, and my girlfriend. So I had that, what other people said they didn't have. And... Uh, so it, and I got right back in school. And so life was back to normal as it was before I left. It's just had that one gap of one year that didn't belong there. I sh that was there. Uh, did you uh, ever return home after going back to school? Did I return where? Uh, back here at home. Yeah. Yeah. So how do, how were you received by your family and your community? Um, everybody happy, of course, relieved. Uh, you know, during that time, I told you this was a, the agrarian community and it was all the young people had moved away, so the percentage of people to be drafted were low. Every one of my neighbors, every one of my brothers that were old enough, Chuck was too young, and all of my cousins that were drafted, were all drafted. And um, everybody knew somebody that didn't make it home. And so the just, I think, relief, it's over. And happiness with that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh Uh, so you mentioned the service didn't change you, but uh, so you, how did it affect the way you relate to others? Oh, the way I what? The way you relate to others. I don't know that it changed how I related to others. Um, if anything, maybe less timid. I I was probably a little, I don't want to say bashful, but not as outgoing as I was after. Maybe more outgoing after that. And there is a sense that, okay, you survived that, you can do anything now. And uh, maybe if there was, now that I think back on it, maybe that was a change. You get a little reckless afterward because you figured, well, you can do anything now. <laughs> so uh, maybe a little reckless. But, you grow out of that then, eventually. Mature out of that, eventually. Uh, did you join a veteran organization? No. You Didn't want to. Okay. I, I had no interest in remembering and recalling the experience. I just had no interest in that. Did you ret attend any reunions or anything no. like that? No. I actually, I don't even know of any that they had with our group. I'm, I know other groups seem to have it, but no. And I, I may now, if I knew of one or there was a group, I may now, but it, for a long time, I, 
I was more interested in suppressing those memories than recalling them. What good does that do? What were some of the awards and medals you received? Um, combat Infantry Badge for being in combat. Um, air Medal. Uh, because you make so many combat assaults or go into a hot LZ. Um, everybody gets, everybody that goes there. There's two Vietnam Service Awards, I don't recall the names of them, that you receive for being there. And, um, and the Bronze Star I have. Uh, you mentioned the Air Medal, so... Uh, how and when did you receive that one? Um, if you go in the hot LZ, and I think because we were hit that day, it was considered a hot LZ, uh, the first day in country. <laughs> well, not the first day in country. The first day I was assigned to the 101st Airborne, I got it. But then that was the two requirements. You either enter a hot LZ or you have 10 combat assaults and... Many combat assaults, and a lot more than 10. Okay. Uh, so, what are some life lessons you learned from your military service? Um, maybe reinforced my idea that uh, um, work hard at what you're doing. And uh, while I was there, I did. And uh, follow orders. <laughs> um, how has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? That's interesting. Um, my feelings about war, I know wars are necessary at times. I didn't know about that one. I really don't know if I had any feelings about it before. <clears throat> um, I just wasn't paying attention to it a lot. It had been going on for years already. <clears throat> but uh, I really didn't know. I knew most of the country was against it. And I would even, at night, uh, when the bars closed at night and walking back uh, back home from the bars, I would, they would have on-campus sit-ins, and I'd sit in on those, and I think it was more to meet girls than it was to protest the war. I never really protested it. I since now know a lot of the history of it, and um, I think we were wrong for being there, uh, because we didn't live up to our side of the bargain, and that's have a have a, an election. The, the country was divided when it was a French colony, until 1954 when Ho Chi Minh beat the French in the Battle of uh, Dien Bien Phu. And in that treaty, they split the country into the North and the South, the North being communist, the South being a democracy. And in four years, they were supposed to have an election to reunite the country and let the people decide. Well, when the four years came up, we wouldn't allow the election because we knew we were going to lose that. And uh, so then Ho Chi Minh said, well, you know, if you're not going to have the election, then we'll invade the South, and he did. And then it was the whole domino theory that we, people talked about back then, like um, if Vietnam falls, then Cambodia and Laos and Thailand and the whole area, the whole country, the whole world will be communist. So it was trying to stop that, and I'm not sure I believed the domino theory. Obviously, it didn't happen. Uh, Laos and Cambodia and Thailand are still free, and Vietnam is a communist country yet. Uh, so what message would you like to leave for future generations who will view or hear this interview? There's times you do have to go to war, and uh, you may, you have to decide whether that's one of them or not. When I was drafted, there were really only two choices. Uh, you either went to Canada or you <laughs> went to war. And uh, there are people that did go to Canada to get out. And 
at some point you just have to trust your leaders and expect they're doing the right thing. In hindsight, I don't know that they would. But in hindsight, I don't know that they would even agree with that. So it's unfair to me to judge what they were doing at that time in real time because I think many of the people who were in favor of the war maybe in hindsight would say, well, we could have done it other ways and we didn't have to sacrifice 53,000 Americans. So I would say just um, try to understand and learn as much as you can and then you are going to have to trust your leaders. I don't think there's another choice. They aren't always going to be right. Many times they were right. They're certainly right in World War II. They're right, I think, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So this is the one they may have made the wrong choices in, but they didn't know. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I just have a few more last questions, but I just want to say thank you so much for taking your time to share your experiences. And it was super interesting. I love learning about uh, everything from your military experience to just anything you think about war. Yeah. Like uh, I want to say thank you for your service. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, I'll just get on with these last few questions. So, Is there anything you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview? Um, I would, yes. I had an opportunity. I've been back to Vietnam several times. Oh, <clears throat> In fact, my first time back was in uh, 1998, and I was working in China at the time. And uh, they have Chinese Lunar New Year's, which is like our Christmas celebration, national uh, holiday. They have time off, and uh, everybody travels during that. And so I traveled to Hanoi and uh, got there and spent several days in Hanoi. And always curious how people were going to, uh, how they'd accept me when they found out I'm an American. And we dropped a lot of bombs on Hanoi and uh, North Vietnam. And the beautiful part was is that I was accepted there as an American and they didn't blame me. They may hate our government, but they didn't blame me. I've traveled a lot in the world since and I find that wherever I go. People may not like our government, but they like us <laughs> as people. And uh, so I did that. I then had a son who, after he graduated from Indiana University, traveled all around the world and had, after he went around the world in a year, decided he liked Vietnam and he went to work there. And so I was there several times while uh, uh, he was working there. And again, uh, and the people there are very accepting of us. Uh, before your son worked there, uh, you mentioned you went there once. So what made you go back? What made me go back? Um, well, the first time was in North Vietnam. I just wanted to see what it was going to be like. Um, but I, when I went back, to visit Nick in South Vietnam. Well, it's all, I shouldn't say it that way now because it's all Vietnam. And uh, when I went there, I did want to go back and see if I could get back up in the areas that I worked in, the AO that I worked in, area of operation. Uh, because at the time, I always thought, you know, if there wasn't a war going on, this is a beautiful country. <laughs> uh, it'd be a great national park. It turns out now there is a national park there. I couldn't get back up to the fire bases we were on because, again, there were no roads, still are no roads, and we arrived by helicopter, and there were no helicopters to take me there. But um, near Da Nang, there is a Bak, Bak, Na, or Bak Ma National Park, and I got to go through there and hike some of the trails there. And that was a little eerie uh, because I, it just put your mind right back to where it was. And uh, I can't say I really enjoyed that. But I did like meeting people, talking to people. And I had one of my experiences when I was walking point after about the first month. They brought out a, 
a guy who was a North Vietnamese soldier at one time. He was an officer in the NVA, North Vietnamese Army, and got in some kind of trouble. I believe he may have even killed an officer. And so he uh, ran away from the Army and uh, what they called Chu Hoid, uh, surrendered to Marines. And they took him, sent him to Camp Evans, where our base camp was, and trained him for working with us. And they assigned him to me. And his name was Vo Bin, and we came very close. So, um, I was teaching him how to English, and my girlfriend Terry was sending us little reading books so he could learn that. And uh, he was keeping me safe because he knew where booby traps could be likely or not likely, and actually pulled me back from one once. Um, but when I was in Da Nang, I saw a guy that I thought for sure was going to be Vobin. I looked and I said, are you Vobin? And no, I wasn't. But uh, I expect Vobin probably isn't alive anymore because at the time when we were doing this, I always said, when this war is over, I'm going to bring you back to our farm. You get back to the United States and you're going to, you can work with my dad on the farm. And I expect someday he would have showed up if he would have made it out alive. But as soon as the North won the war, He'd had to have gone into some kind of hiding or seclusion because as soon as they found out who he was, uh, he'd probably be executed. So. That's sad. I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, uh, so you mentioned you worked in China. Uh, were you an engineer or anything else? I went there as an engineer and then ended up, I was a CEO of a joint venture that we started to build parts for Volkswagen in the automotive, the automotive industry. Uh, why did you move to China? Uh, for the starting the joint venture and at the time I wanted to, I was the vice president in the, the company and it seemed the previous two presidents had international experience and so I thought okay I need to do this to prepare myself so I went to China for that purpose, but also to get the joint venture up and running and then ran the joint venture for two years. And it was a great experience. Uh, why did you move to Benzie County? Um, for a while I was homeless. And uh, when I tell people this, and when Andrea, my wife, goes crazy because I was intentional. Um, I retired and then I hiked the Appalachian Trail and everybody said, what are you going to do when you're done hiking the Appalachian Trail? I said, I've got six months to think about it. And I did figure it out. I said, well, I started my career in the military. I want to finish it, bookend it with the Peace Corps. And uh, so I was going to join the Peace Corps and uh, signed up for it and got accepted. But I had retired early because I had a heart condition. And uh, because of that, they wouldn't give me an assignment. They kept sending me back to confirm that it still doesn't exist, doesn't. It's called premature ventricular contractions. In fact, I had two procedures for it, and neither of them improved, improved it. But when I hiked the Appalachian Trail against all of my doctor's advice, because they said, if you have an incident out there, you're not going to get any help. And, um, but when I finished hiking the trail, went back for a checkup, they said, I can't believe this. Your PVCs are gone. And they said, I can't explain it. I can. I said, 2,174 miles. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, so uh, I had sold my house in preparation to go away to the Peace Corps when they accepted me, but then they wouldn't give me any assi an, an assignment. And because they don't want anybody with a health condition out in the middle of uh, some strange country. And uh, so during that time, I just, drove around and uh, wanted to find where's the best place to live in when, when I'm retired. And I had lived in, when I came back from China, I spent a year in Traverse City. I loved all four seasons. And uh, the more I drove around the country and I just kept coming back here, I said, I really like this place and said this. So I started looking for a place around Traverse City and ended up in Lake Ann. Uh, so is there anything you've always wanted to share about your service or veteran experience that you never have? 
No, I, you know, I very seldom talk about it. Uh, um, but I did. I have two children that know nothing about my experience. An older, I have two young children. But I have two older children from a previous marriage. They're um, in their 40s. They have no idea of what my experience was like. And they have, one of Ben has, I have grandchildren with Ben, and they would never know, and how would they know? So I did sit down and I did write it out in the last several months. And more thinking, when this idea was talked about, I thought, well, I need to think about this and put it down and kind of recapture that experience in my own mind. Okay. Uh, what would you like people to know or remember from your story? As unpleasant as this, sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. And uh, to separate yourself from the person you were before you're in the service and do the things you have to do when you are in the service. And when you're done, you can go back and be a civilian again. Uh, is there anything else we should talk about that we haven't covered? I think you covered everything. The questions, I think, were very good questions that take me through the experience. Okay, and lastly, uh, what do you wish more people knew about veterans? Um, that they're not well taken care of for all they put on the line. And particularly uh, with the Agent Orange, I don't know if you've heard much about it. Agent Orange was a defoliant they sprayed around around all the fire braces because you can't have coverage for enemy to be creeping up on you at night. So you defoliate the jungle all around the fire bases. And then the Asha Valley was a main supply route and that's what we were trying to keep interrupted supplies from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. And uh, so they defoliated parts of that. But anyway, when they spray these fire bases and everything and spray the jungle, all that eventually residual runs down into the streams. Well, when we're out for three weeks, where do you think we got our drinking water from? Those streams. Yeah. And when we needed to bathe, where do you think we're bathing in? Those streams. And uh, there's, I think, a lot of things that Agent Hor Orange has done to people that we don't even know yet because it's not studied. And... Um, I think their interest is if, quite frankly, all they have to do is wait another 10 years and we're all gone. So there is no liability or anything that they'd have to, benefits they'd have to provide for, for um, veterans. So, and I don't think just Vietnam veterans, I think any veterans. People enjoy this country and the freedoms and everything they have every day. Well, how do you think it stayed that way? It's because people were willing to go and put their life on the line for our country, and I think they're owed something for that. Now, me, myself, I don't think I need anything, but there are others that do. And uh, I think we need to do more for our veterans and take better care of them. Well, uh, I think that's it. Again, thank you so much, and thank you for your service. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Um,